realistically 98%, and some people say it's 99.9% of all scripts submitted are unreadable. How do most non-professional screenwriters create plot? Often it's the same as professional screenwriters, but professional screenwriters can evaluate what they're creating, <clears throat> whereas non-professionals don't have the ability to eyeball their material at a professional critique level so that they'll get excited about an idea they have and it can either be too derivative where it's been used in way too many movies or TV shows or stage plays so that most people wouldn't be interested in it unless the execution of it is extraordinary, which kind of by definition, a non-professional scriptwriter is generally not capable of doing. Now, some people are just out of the box geniuses and that's different, but not only is that extremely rare, but uh, Anders Ericsson in his book, Peak said that they looked everywhere for prodigies who were out of the box and just could do it with no training as good as the best people. They said those people do not exist and they've scoured the earth for them. You hear about them, but it's not true. So that, for instance, say someone has an innate ability at chess and maybe they were a prodigy as it, at it as a kid, but didn't push their capabilities. And they may still, still perceive themselves as a prodigy, but if you put them up against a genuine chess master, they've never found anybody who, without the proper training, could go all the way. Uh, and I'd never heard that before. I thought there was such a thing as prodigy. Anders Erickson calls it the prodigy myth and they pretty much categorically disproved it. You know, and I think that writers who come out of left field and who never had any formal training and who write stuff that works in really unusual ways or they're just brilliant at it, they probably work their butts off. It's not like they woke up one morning and said, I think I'll be a screenwriter today and spit out a masterpiece. They may be coming at it completely from left field, but they put the work into it. So there's the distinction in that. So there's no savant. There's no screenwriting savant where they're able to, to emulate, you know, how some these savants can, can play a masterpiece without having known music in terms of reading notes and things like that. I, I think there probably are. But I think they also work their butt off to polish their craft. But you never know. Anything's quite possible. Uh, the real problem is that most scripts suck. Seriously. And so those are hard numbers that realistically 98%, and some people say it's 99. 9% of all scripts submitted are unreadable uh, for a variety of reasons. But if you don't have it all working together on the page, then the script doesn't work. And so how non-professional writers come up with ideas is really all across the board from, you know, watching some movie and wanting to basically just copy it to having 
like a fever dream that they wake up from in a cold sweat and like, my God, I got to write that. And maybe it's brilliant. And, and often they are. Uh, but almost always they have to have the craft to execute it properly. You know, maybe it's a story their grandfather told them about what happened to them in World War II or whatever, and it electrifies them and they want to turn it into a story. It might be just rolling ideas around in their head and two odd ideas clank together at one point and you're like, that's a weird story. You know, sometimes it's just colliding two different stories together. Uh, the story Alfred Bester tells, um, he wrote an amazing book of short stories called The Golden Man, and one of them is called Fondly Fahrenheit, and it's about a robot, a really high-end robot in the future that is the apex of robot invention, and it can literally carve marble like Michelangelo, like anything, and he hires it out to do jobs and it makes him a good living, but it gets overheated and something goes wrong and the robot kills the person it was with. So then he goes on the run with it and puts it out for lesser jobs because they're looking for the robot that can carve like Michelangelo. So now he has a teaching Latin, you know, on another planet and it overheats and kills some. So he keeps going on the run and keeps downgrading what he's hiring the robot for. And Bester talked about the creation of that idea and the original idea was basically that, was that high-end robot malfunctions. And he said it just wasn't enough. It was, it was not a complex idea, it was too simple. And he shelved it. And then it, uh, a number of years later, he came across the description of a psychological malady in which one person thinks they're another person, where I genuinely think I'm you. And it's like a it's like a mental illness. And I act like I'm you and I interact with you like I'm you. And he said, that's really interesting. Never heard of that before. And as he was like rolling it around in his hands, he reached up for the other idea and he, he did what he called collide them together to where this robot that was malfunctioning, part of the malfunction is that the robot thinks it's the master. And he said, now that, had some juice as a story. And he made it into a fascinating short story called Fondly Fahrenheit. And it's amazing, you know, and it's just that kind of thing. And that's one of the things that we do in the two-year training program that I'm doing uh, is that each student has the, the core of the course, the 18-month center of the course, we're constantly working on about six to eight scripts at the same time when we range from one to the next. So we might be working on an action thriller, then the next day we're on a wacko comedy, and the next day it's a horror story, and the next day it's like an adventure story. So we're changing gears constantly, they're learning different genres, and using the same tools and techniques across a full spectrum of ideas. But they also have writing assignments, exercises to gain facility with the individual skills, uh, learning games and other things. And one of the things they have to do is to spit out a new story idea every day. And I emphasize like, just spit it out. Don't get precious with it. Don't beat yourself up. And if they love the idea, they keep it in their private folder. If it's just some dumb idea they just spit up with and they're not attached to it, they put it into the group story bin so that anybody can work with it. We play with it. We'll take one and go, oh, let's create a dilemma for that. And if it begins to have legs, then that'll become one of the six to eight scripts that we build. Um, and in the process of them generating a story idea every day, you know, I'm saying to them, don't worry if it's dumb. Don't try to come up with genius stuff. Just keep spitting them out. Because in the course of this two years, you'll develop hundreds of ideas and you'll get in the habit of spitting them out. And I said, you know, you may find that you end up colliding your stupid bank robbery movie with your crazy time travel story. 
And like you collide those two together and all of a sudden you got a fun comedy out of two lame looking ideas. So that's part of what I try to bring to helping my students acquire better attack as storytellers and uh, just better facility creating stories and being able to recognize a lousy idea from a good one. Um, <clears throat> oh, and by the way, uh, the term attack as a storyteller uh, came from the writer Alfred Bester. He, um, he was a big influence in, on me as a writer. He wrote two phenomenal novels, science fiction novels in 1954 and 56. One was The Star is My Destination, the other one is The Demolished Man. And he's in many ways considered one of the absolute godfathers of science fiction. He was like the primary influence on all these people like Heinlein and um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, all these people like worshiped him and took off, you know, built upon the level of energy that he brought. He was a, he originally wrote radio plays for The Shadow. It was a, you know, a radio play, The Shadow Knows and comic book stories. And he said that kind of comic book writing taught him a lot about attack as a storyteller, entertainment value, the outrageousness of great storytelling. And just, he said, writing for a radio play, you got to get right on it. He said, start at white heat and build from there. So his, his, his attack as a storyteller has influenced me a lot and I try to um, inspire my students to that level of kind of ferocity, like, you know, it's, it's like be a wild animal, you know, you become a writer to be domesticated creature, to be told what to do and sit in a corner and salute, you know, it's like, don't let anybody tell you how to do this stuff, you know, it's just, it's just the, the whole society teaches people to conform and sit down and shut up and not, it, it, it doesn't say don't be original, but it diffuses in the, in, the, in the sense of diffuse, like make it weaker, D-I-F-F-U-S-E, but also defuse, like to disarm a bomb, to take away the fangs and claws of people. They, people are domesticated in society and we need wild animals. You know, we need people that are out there pushing the borders and seeing things in an entirely new way and refusing to accept the way things are. And that's so much the job of storytellers is to lead the way and inspire and show people new ways to do things. Um, but hang on, I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but I like what you're saying, but let me just play the devil's advocate for a second. If you don't know the rules, you can't break them kind of thing. So right. when, when you say to, to, to push back and don't let someone tell you what to do, what if someone's this free sort of loose cannon, but they're going about story in the wrong way? And well, then, yeah, okay. there's lots of different, there's really an infinite number of approaches to any kind of story or anything. You know, like even just the way Quentin Tarantino with Pulp Fiction kind of flipped storytelling in a certain way that we hadn't seen done in movies much before and did it really well, but he still had really sophisticated structural technique because he had three different stories written into a coherent whole. So it wasn't a mess, it was a gem. So there's so many different ways to tackle it. And what I'm talking about is attack as a storyteller. There's a difference between wildly explosive creativity as a storyteller and substantial craft as a dramatist. So there are not so much rules for a dramatist, but a process of thinking, habits of mind, like how do you make something work for, for dramatic presentation, 
real actors acting it out in front of an audience and it grabs the audience. It's all about the audience. If a, a movie playing to an empty theater has no power, it's just shadows on the wall. The power of the film resides in the response of the audience. So you want like wildly aggressive storytelling and rigorous technique as a dramatist. It's like, it's, it's, it's an interesting intersection of something that's organic and messy and something that's a hard science. Like medicine is a good example because medicine taking on like weird forms of cancer or something that keep evolving and it's not like they can control it. They're just bringing a rigorous science to grapple with this organic thing. And a, your story idea might be unlike anything anybody's ever seen. And yet you still have to make it work as a performance medium so that your craft as a dramatist can help you wrestle that story into a shape that makes it performable and gripping without sterilizing it. You're not trying to defang its energy. You're just trying to make it so that it actually works so that actors can really act it and it really grabs an audience. So it's, it's kind of like inherently contradictory or it may sound that way at first, but really it's just like, make your stories as explosively creative as you possibly can. And it's kind of like with the old Samsonite luggage where you put a whole bunch of stuff in it and then you kneel on it and just click the latches and then it's in there. If you can get that story into shape so that it's performable and grabs the audience, then it works. You know, even if it's something as out there as being John Malkovich, where you're like watching the movie going, whoa, look at that. And, you know, and it's brilliant and it's fun and it's different and it works. It grabs an audience, it's actable, and yet it's coming not even from left field, but like way out there. And it's, we need that kind of fresh energy and refusal to knuckle under to normal story patterns. And even the craft of the dramatist, the more craft you have, see, it comes down to principle and method. There are certain principles that underlie what tend to make the tools work. And there are certain methods that embody those principles. So like if, the, if you have certain principles that are active, there are certain methods that are created that turn that principle into an implement. And so that the particular tool you're using may not work exactly for the story you're trying to tell, but, it, but you can adapt the story because you're still serving the same principle. There just may be a different mechanism that can embody that principle so that you, the more craft you have as a dramatist, the more you can adapt because you're still, you're still achieving what you want to achieve. You just find a different way to do it. Can you give me an example of a domesticated writer? And I'm not talking about physically and at home, staying home during COVID, mm. just, just someone that is in a mindset of sort of the masses and versus this wild, unhinged, feral writer. Well, generally those are the writers of the scripts that don't work, of which there are millions of them over, you know, decades. Uh, so that even if you look, for instance, at a movie that seems very calm on the surface, like Ordinary People, it won Best Picture and a bunch of other Oscars, I think in 80 or 81, something around there. It's almost just a parlor drama, like people sitting around a living room arguing. But there's so much intensity and so much ferocity and so much attack. It really goes right for the jugular vein. It's not making weak choices. It's making very strong choices and really making us take a good hard look at the ugly or dysfunctional parts of ourselves so that it has a tremendous attack, a lot of magnitude, a lot of depth. 
So, and, and that's like what I'm talking about. When I say domesticated, I just mean like making small, safe choices where, you know, you're reading the script and you like the, you like the pitch and then you read the script and it's like, the pitch sounded so promising and they just sat back and, you know, phoned it in. Look at like at this juncture, they could have made so many better choices, but they made a weak one and then it just keeps, it's like, you know, just a lack of attack. You had talked about attention versus intention. So that has to do with <clears throat> what um, in what Anders Ericsson in his book Peak and in his whole career talks about as deliberate practice. And that is that say that you're a you're in training to be an Olympic ski racer. And it's a series of individual skills that each of which has to be better than anybody in the world if you're gonna win. You, like every move you make so that your coach is showing you video of, like as a skier I know that you to ski right you're doing six things at the same time. You have to do them all at once and then you're really good. But you have to learn each one in isolation and then combine them. So that your coach would be saying, you're leaning a little too forward there and you're not popping on your, when you, when you change, you know, and they'll, and they'll isolate certain things that they need to improve upon. Like you keep, you keep not straightening your knee. So they might give them exercise and have them do it a lot. <clears throat> For instance, like one of my friends who was a, uh, played minor league hockey, the junior B they call it, his coach would show them how to do it and then say, go do that 50,000 times and then come back. It's that type of thing, a deliberate practice where your ski coach would say, you keep not extending your elbow all the way. You gotta overcome that. So every day you'll do that maybe a thousand times before you do anything else. And instead of going, I hate this, you, you, you do it with full attention and full intention so that you're really paying attention to it and you're intending to like, I'm gonna master this. And yeah, it's boring and everything else, but you're, you stay focused and that makes your brain build the neural network stronger and better. Whereas if you're not focused and don't have strong intention, then you don't really get the, the cumulative benefit in the brain structure that seats it as a, deeply habitual. So you, once you've done that the whole season, when you get into the race, then every time you take a turn, you never miss that elbow lock so that it becomes built in. And that's what Erickson called deliberate practice. And what they said was that they found that you don't want to give the people you're training drills, but give them short addictive games. They're literally doing the exact same thing, but you make an addictive game out of it so that they can stay focused on it better.